Back when we were allowed to own shit, there was this beautiful store called Blockbuster, which can be better described as a candy shop for eyes and ears alike. A little stench of sweat, but it's fine. <coughs> And in my own perception of real-life lore, I like to believe that David Cook... No, that's the wrong one. The guy who found the Blackbuster was just chilling one day watching Terminator and said, Damn, this is the shit. This movie is days old. The main actor can barely speak English. So I'm coming day and night. I mean, it's terrific, right? <laughs> but I already know there's gonna be a Blockbuster movie and... <gasps> I'm gonna create a whole store chain called Blockbuster. Filming bitches with copies of Terminator, just Terminator. And Ren Terminator, all the time. My god, this movie is amazing. People have to watch this. I love Terminator, holy fuck. <clears throat> Luckily for us, uh, it didn't end up just renting Terminator. We rented out the movies. And maybe I was pulling this out of my ass. But hey, the dates match. But this idea of renting physical media for a couple of days was actually huge. At the time, we didn't have the luxury of scheduling our own entertainment accordingly to our free time. You're busy at pretending that you like your micromanager of a boss or sucking at math. And when you got home, if NBC told you that you're gonna watch a thousand reruns of Seinfeld, then guess what? You're gonna watch a thousand reruns of Seinfeld, goddammit. Blockbuster was a cheap alternative for people to watch what they wanted, without committing to a full purchase. Fast forward a few years and what do we have? The golem that we created to defeat the big, mean cable television turning against us, shooting ads out of its ass like it's nothing. As if we're already not paying for a whole McDonald's menu for our Prime Video subscription. And goddamn, McDonald's got expensive too. Oh, Jesus Christ, give me a break, inflation. What is even the point right now? What are we even trying to defeat when the combined cost of subscription services is getting closer day by day to cable television? You want a harsh pill of truth? It's kind of our fault. Now, we can't really blame anyone specific for the downfall of services like Blockbuster. With the popularity of the internet, it was bound for physical copies to take a hit. It happened everywhere, with newspapers being a waste of trees, music being carried inside a small stick of butter looking device, instead of a, like a whole massive waffle maker. So to escalate this to movies was predictable. And I guess what you may know today, Netflix didn't really start as a natural competitor to Blockbuster due to its on-demand video service, what we call today maybe streaming. This happened a little bit later. Netflix was initially a mail service in 1995. The only difference Netflix could be highlighted against Blockbuster was the fact that they would send the copy to your own house. And a decade later, YouTube plagued the world with videos of cats and dudes getting their balls busted. Literally, actually. This new form of using the internet to provide selectable content made some thieving ass executives scratch their chins at Netflix. Hey bro, can I, can I copy your homework? Uh, yeah, sure, just change a little bit so it's not that obvious, you know. Man, what the fuck is this? There was a huge appeal of using the same system, but on Hollywood-level productions. It was inevitable to happen. Netflix was just able to grab it fresh off the oven. But Blockbuster was a little bit old by now. Their knees hurt, their, their joints were not working so well. They were a bit late. They later tried to remedy their own lack of action by implementing Video On Demand in 2007 by acquiring MovieLink, but it was way too late. Pair this up with Blockbuster executives as just having a dick measuring contest and you have a one-on-one on how to destroy your goddamn company. Blockbuster now was a relic and that logo just causes pain now. <laughs> Blockbuster closing doors in 2010 meant that Netflix now had an uncontested territory over rented access to digital media. And the time couldn't have been more perfect as television itself was changing. We were accustomed to this typical form of syndicated shows. You know, those commercial 20 minute episodes where it's either a comedy, a crime drama, or a bunch of doctors who are way too horny and incompetent. This is perfect if you try to feed ads into your audience to create a form of fabricated retention since there's no way to skip or control the timeline. That's how they would grip you. You have to watch it in order to find out who killed the streetwalker, which was always a the guest star or the guy who had the best alibis. And I mean, always. But the 2000s is the era that marks a shift in what we watch, turning out to be the sweetest era of television. Cable was still standing, trading some sweet punches. I'm talking about the typical HBO production with full one hour episodes, uh, full of profanity and uh, artistic expression. 
let's say, with a flow that wasn't designed to accommodate for ad slots. Even though this was cable television, HBO was not compatible with typical uh, cable television. The episodes would be way too long for viewer retention. These new dark dramas would either not be suited for prime time television, considering, you know, younger audiences, or compatible with typical advertisement. Minus some shameless product placements as always. Yet shows like The Sopranos, Breaking Bad and The Wire were already blowing up charts with their movie-sized episodes. HBO was able to do this with cable television, but it still had the whole issue of scheduling. Unlike Blockbuster though, HBO was not a whiny little boomer who refused to adapt in favor of these new young bucks like Netflix. And so adapting they did. In 2010, HBO made their award-winning shows available in their own streaming platform called HBO Now at the time, currently HBO Max. For the late 2000s and early 2010s, if you had Netflix, HBO Now and Hulu perhaps, you had access to the vast majority of quality content and top productions currently available on television at the time. Oh, and movies, of course. All for a fraction of the cost of cable television. It didn't matter if it was movies, shows, 20 minute episodes, one hour episodes. You had a central hub of the shit that you wanted to see in a way and time you wanted to see. However, just like every goddamn content creator in existence and their grandma has a podcast, all media giants now had to create a clusterfuck of a service of their own. Because companies can possibly see a trend without finding a way to turn it into an excruciating experience for the consumer. After 2015, you had studios interested in cutting off their wasted potential profit margin, let's call it, by creating their own storefront for their made content. After all, Netflix would nearly double every yearly licensing investment budget, as in 2013 they paid $63 million for the rights of multiple shows and movies to profit $112 million out of them. That's profit that could go for the studios if they sold the content on their own terms straight from the source. And so Disney created Disney+, Plus, Paramount with Paramount+, Plus, NBC with Peacock, Amazon with Prime Video, it was like a colony of wasps. And typically in a liberated free market, competition is good for the consumer. It destabilizes monopolies, creates better options, better control of terms of services, incentivizes proper platform maintenance. But this concept doesn't really work with subscription-based service. Not when shows and movies start migrating out of your currently subscribed service to another to which you do not possess a subscription for. As it happened with The Office being pulled away from Netflix. So long, gay boys! Wait a second! Which was a huge blow, being one of the most shows, most watched shows. Yeah, my dyslexic ass ate those words, I'm sorry. Even today, all this just to go to goddamn Peacock. Like, I mean, goddamn Peacock. Really, I did. I do not want to own a service that is called Peacock, man. Like, oh shit, it's not even available in my country. That's great. But many followed suit, making Netflix lose more and more ground. Which brings us to the domino effect, baby. Netflix is losing subscribers due to all these shows and movies just migrating out, forcing the company to compensate the revenue loss by jacking up the prices per loyal subscriber. We, the consumers, like the good boys and girls that we are, just bend over at every subscription price increase, creating an enabling environment which reached a ridiculous pinnacle of having streaming services like Amazon Prime Video plastering us with ads in a premium subscription tier, which is the whole point of why I'm paying a little bit over. I don't mind all those ad-based tier subscriptions. It provides a choice for the customer that I appreciate while the company can still profit some from advertisement. But this is ridiculous. Oh yeah, this is a rich one too. Oh, you're already putting fuel in our yachts on your waiter's income? Thank you so much. Now pay more for the movie. As if it wasn't bad enough. We even had Netflix paddling back on their, what we thought to be the consumer friendly approach of allowing password sharing. Because yeah, up until this point, Netflix was that cool uncle at the barbecue that lets you, you know, drink a cold one or two without snitching. But now we got Nanny McPhee over here or some shit. All this while their price still increases. <sighs> Netflix. 
We were supposed to defeat him, not join them. Perhaps we still have not reached our critical mass yet. After all, it is still considerably cheaper to run a subscription on all streaming services, at least the major ones, rather than paying for a cable TV package, which is usually packed with an ungodly amount of useless animals. Uh, what? Which is usually packed with an ungodly amount of useless channels. Oh, oh look, fishing, that's cool. Shit, it's better than watching the Acolyte, at least. <laughs> we also have to be fair and appreciate the fact these streaming services were actually responsible in developing some recent bangers. I mean, the Fallout series turned out to be better than I was expecting. Todd Howard needed a win after Fallout 76, after all, you know what I mean? I mean, look at that, he's so heavy, that is so cute. <laughs> All I know is that we should not be enabling this constant tipping our toes in the water to see if they're cool with it type of behavior. Greedy behavior, I might add. Because it's not as if people don't have other means, you know? I'm not advocating anything. YouTube, I'm not advocating anything. But she put people in a corner and you might not recover even a single cent from them. The funny thing about greed is that it's highly destructive. And it works both ways.